In this video series, we will try to intuitively understand the theory of deep learning and build up to a practical example of implementing a network from scratch in Python. Before we delve into the specifics of the implementation, it is important to first understand the theory so that we fully grasp what it is exactly we're trying to implement. In this first video, we'll go over the very basics of neural networks and explain what they are, how they work, and how they can be represented in matrix form. The first question one may have is what exactly is a neural network? Many of you may have already seen diagrams like this, and although this is a valid depiction of a deep neural network, this form might be a bit unenlightening. So let's first break down what this diagram represents. What this structure says is that if we feed input vector data x, then in the next layer, each node will be a weighted sum of the inputs of the previous layer. For example, if we denote these four weights as w1, w2, w3, and w4, then the node a1 will be equal to w1x1 plus w2x2 plus w3x3 plus w4x4, effectively saying that this hidden layer output is determined through a general function applied to the input values x1 to 4. This function can be seen as being parameterized by the weights in the network, as w1, w2, w3, and w4 are all fixed beforehand. We then do the same process for a2, using the same inputs x1 to x4. However, the weights used now are a different independent set of weights. The same process can then be applied for every node in that layer in the same way as before, and once we work out all the values in a layer, we then have the input values for the next layer, and so we move forward. We eventually propagate forward enough that we get to the end of the network and get an output value y. In a general sense, we can interpret these neural networks as an arbitrary mapping function from an input space to an output space. This entire mapping function only depends on the weights in the network, but any input vector will prompt a string of underlying operations to occur eventually yielding to some predicted output. Let's quickly go over a basic numeric example to better explain what we've gone over so far. Assume that we're given three numeric measurements of a dog, its height, length, and tail length. Given these measurements, what we want to do is predict how heavy the real dog is. These three numeric values are the basis for our prediction, and therefore, they will be the input to the neural network. Let's pretend that the first three weights of this layer are set at one, minus one, and two. We know that to get the value of a node, we multiply weights and all inputs together and then sum. So we do 1 times 50, minus 1 times 120, 2 times 30, and then sum them all together to get minus 10, the value of this node in this hidden layer. We follow the exact same process for all nodes in the layer, where maybe the network weights used in these operations are completely different. Then each following layer uses the same process, however they use the outputs of the previous layer. Eventually we get to the end of the network and output a single value. It might be conceivable that there exists a certain combination of weight parameters such that the output of the network will be a good approximation of the true mass of the dog for any input measurement. If that were so, then we'd have a general mapping function from length characteristics of the dog to its real mass. Finding a good set of weights which approximate well the task is a whole different challenge, but that will be covered in the next video. Hopefully, this diagram now makes sense and we understand what happens with deep neural networks. This representation is visually helpful to explain the underlying operations, however it is quite impractical as it uses too many loose variables. To motivate a better way to look at these networks, let's just focus in on one layer and look at the equations again. Let the input to the layer be a1, a2, and a3, and the output of the layer be b1, b2, and b3. To get the value of an output node, we multiply the weights with each connected node, so if we name the weights connected to the first output w11, w12, and w13, then we see that b1 is equal to this sum here. We can then repeat the equation for every other output node in the layer using similar notations for the weights. Finally, we end up with a set of equations linking all the outputs to all the inputs. People familiar with linear algebra may recognize that this set of operations can be represented very efficiently using matrices. In fact, this matrix multiplication here represents the exact same set of equations as above. This new form, however, takes advantage of the parallel nature of matrices and leads to a much more compact set of equations. As a quick refresher for why this is so, let's look at the multiplication. Recall that for matrix multiplications, the rows are multiplied element-wise with the columns, and then we calculate the sum. We can see visually here that after unpacking the matrix multiplication, the exact same three equations are written in parallel. This shows us that this layer can actually be represented as a matrix of its weights, and the output of layer is simply the matrix multiplication of the weights and inputs. Back to the entire connected network. If we write out all the equations going from the input to the output, we see that it gets very messy as there are so many weight parameters thrown around. However, by simply structuring the parameters by putting weights in matrices, and by vectorizing all the intermediate variables, then all the clutter is removed and the entire network can be described using some very simple matrix statements.
Furthermore, we're able to relate the input and output in an incredibly convenient manner, as the output is just multiple sequential matrix multiplications applied to the input. This does, however, highlight one large problem with the current approach. Multiplying many matrices together will just yield a single matrix. Therefore, the entire deep network will be exactly equivalent to a single layer and the extra complexity from having many layers seem unnecessary. However, if we add nonlinear units at each time step, then the network has stronger capacity to model more complex functions and it is no longer replaceable by any simple linear function. The nonlinear function is applied element-wise and the most commonly used one today is the ReLU. This function is very basic. If the value is smaller than zero, then the output is zero. Otherwise, the output is simply the input. For example, if we add ReLUs after each layer in the network, then whenever the input is negative, the next output node will simply be rounded to zero. Well, that's everything for today's video. Hopefully you now understand neural networks better than you did before. And in the next video, we'll learn about optimization and how we can train the networks using gradient descent.